And welcome into another edition of Miked Up in the morning here on Pittsburgh Sports Live and Pittsburgh Sports Now. As the madness season continues here through March, this now a welcome for a Tuesday morning. We did take Monday off as we were recuperating from the tournament, and I had uh, you, and Mike, you, had, you were recuperating. I have to bring this up. How was the uh, <laughs> how was the wedding shower? That 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 that, that was the uh, event of the weekend. I know that why wow, you had to take it off. It was a, a that's a big deal for you. Yeah, that was that was a big deal. So that was Saturday this past weekend. I, I am recuperating from that. And <laughs> it was a fantastic event. I will say the only thing that kind of threw me for a loop, as I told you in a text, I had it all timed perfectly. I was going to lunch with her father right near there. One of her bridesmaids was going to text me when I had to come with flowers. And I got a text before we were even finished eating, probably 40 minutes before I thought it was going to happen. So I had to hurry things up, get over there, but that all worked out. She was still opening gifts. I actually brought flowers for not only my fiance, but also her mom, my mom, and her stepmom. So I was flowers for everybody, and that was big compliments. There were even other women there saying that yeah, that, that were mothers. Yeah, they were saying, well, I didn't get flowers. Only my daughter got flowers. They <laughs> should have got flowers too. So that worked out wonderfully. And then, of course, I ended the weekend with West Virginia losing, which is why we didn't do the show Monday, because I was, I was up late doing that post-game show and the, and the yeah. coverage there for WV Sports Now. But, yeah, that was a beautiful shower. Now we just have a lot of stuff in our basement now with all these gifts we didn't really need, uh, I will yeah. say. Congratulations. <laughs> It'll be, uh, be a fun time. Look forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's in June. So it, it is happening. It is coming up. But at, at, he's Mike Vakovic, and I'm Mike Osti. And, again, this is Miked Up here on a Tuesday morning. Presented by Martin Lawn Services. So we recap the weekend there with my big event of the wedding shower and, and getting that wedding underway. And of course, the big event for everybody else is March Madness and all the college basketball games happening, including here even last night and yesterday, as we're now getting finalized for the Sweet 16. And as I talked with a colleague on his radio show today when I appeared, you want to get to the event where there's a saying. There's no round 32 is not as cool for the banner. Sweet 16 and beyond, at least there's a saying. So we're going to discuss that and kind of recap the wild tournament to this point. Mike, you had one of those major upsets with Ohio or Virginia, but my bracket's been busted. Uh, mm -hmm. I took it out with the trash because luckily trash day was Monday. Threw it out there, get out of my house, and, and maybe I'll burn it. We're also going to talk some Steelers news recently and, and a little bit of a surprising Steelers past week for what many expected in their off season, and then I'll obviously touch on some pirate news as well uh, to kind of round out the circuit. So to get things underway, Mike, you did call Ohio or Virginia. That was one upset, but there had been several others. Oral Roberts still playing basketball with multiple wins there. Even West Virginia losing as a three seed despite dealing with a team that they're unfamiliar with and how they play with the zone, Syracuse and 11. Once again, Death taxes in Syracuse sleeping through regular season, being a high seed and somehow getting at least to the Sweet 16. They actually got to a Final Four doing the same thing a few years ago. A lot of upsets, a lot of surprises to this point. Illinois losing and, and out already as a one seed. Obviously, Gonzaga and some of those chalk teams are still around. Ohio State, though, they're gone, and they lost right away, which was surprising. Many had them going pretty far. Texas losing early. The Big Ten not really impressing so far in this tournament what are your overall thoughts it's been a, a tournament that many predicted chalk and we are getting anything but that to this point well uh, a couple things number one i i i think i said on here i thought it was gonna be a very competitive tournament i right. I, I think uh I, I remember the night that the brackets came out uh you know the next morning you and i talked about how competitive uh, the first and even second rounds were usually those are give, you know giveaways at least the first round right yeah exactly and, and until you get to the 16 where you have really good matchups you're having a really good second round matchups here and i think you're seeing that with right. uh, some of the games uh very disappointed in the performance of uh the big 10. uh i know people are going to talk about the ACC, but I think if you see where some of, where some of their higher seeds were seeded, it, it wasn't like the Big Ten where you have Ohio State out. You, you have two have, ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, to me, they, they as I tweeted, uh, they crapped the bed. I used a different <laughs> one. Uh, yeah, uh, for lack of a better phrase. 
<laughs> yeah, they, uh, they crapped the bed. Um, but I actually have all st still my four teams left. Uh, okay. In the final four, I had uh, Gonzaga, Alabama, Houston, and Baylor. So I, I, I kind of like where I sit there. Okay. I think what you're going to have now is you're going to – I think it's going to be a very surprising if uh, Gonzaga, Baylor – in Michigan, don't I? I don't expect Alabama. Although I picked them, I don't expect Alabama to beat Michigan. I think they're playing at a different level right now, and I think in the end, everyone's going to get what they want. In that, there's some upsets first couple rounds, but in the end, uh, when, when it matters in the Final Four, I think you're going to have, you know, right. three of the four best teams in college uh, college basketball, and that's what you know people want. In all honesty, with the exception of a two-week blip because of COVID, so it wasn't their fault, and they admittedly turned around and were very, very cold in Baylor, losing their first couple games of the year, including getting smacked around by an underachieving Kansas team most of this season. Gonzaga, Baylor, and Michigan were the top three teams exactly. all year long. I will say that out of those three, and Baylor has some pressure too because of how good they were, but they have the COVID excuse. Michigan has been there before. They've been there recently. Honestly, um, they're, they're looking like almost a perennial powerhouse program here is what they kind of built, been built up into becoming now. There's tons of pressure on Gonzaga, though. They finally got over the hump, got to a Final Four, got to the championship game recently after so many years getting to that point and building it up really from John Stockton to now. And they need that championship to kind of solidify everything, especially this year where they finally did play a tough schedule. It wasn't just their easier conference. They were playing a tough schedule. So there's still pressure on them. But when you look at the map in front of them, you look at the path in front of them, it's still wide open to at least get to the Final Four. A uh, question for you, though, because some were – and you had Alabama. Some were concerned with Michigan, despite being really, really good. Unlike – Gonzaga they were banged up heading into this tournament so that's the reason why we're seeing some upsets as well some of these teams aren't as healthy as they were months ago separate from the pandemic any concerns about Michigan not being as healthy as they maybe would have been several months ago it seems like that's no longer a conversation but this isn't the starting five they would have dreamed of playing in the final four but yet they're still good enough they could be doing it no I, I think they're uh I think the they're common. Gonzaga is the only team that I think can match them with the front court and the back court. Right. Uh, as far as the depth they have, uh, if it wasn't so deep, then maybe. But I, I just think even some of the start or some of the uh, guys in Juwan Howard's um, rotation could be starters for other Power Five programs. So uh, I just think their their path, as you mentioned, their path is very cleared out Gonzaga and Baylor. If those two don't make it with all the upsets. Especially with Ohio State losing, because I admittedly had Ohio State in my Final Four. They lose right away, of course. With Ohio State gone, and Houston's good, but they're not as battle-tested. Right. West Virginia gone. They were a team with some talent that maybe some thought could get to at least an Elite Eight. They lose in the round of 32. Because of all of that, and Syracuse is very, very good in their Jim Beheim, and it's not a mid-major. They're, they're a perennial tournament team, but – it feels like this is Baylor's region to win. And if they don't, it's very, very disappointing, of course. Pressure still very much on Gonzaga. And honestly, I think Juwan Howard is not getting the credit that he deserves. Yes, he is doing a great job. But it's easier said than done to be a former great player, especially when you are coaching the program that you were great at. That's a lot of pressure. He was a member of the Fab Five. He was part of those back-to-back -back Final Four teams that almost won a title and lost those two runner-up games. He was part of that revolutionary Michigan tenure that kind of changed the game overall with those freshmen. And he had a solid NBA career, was on the, the big three Heat team, played for a long time. Nothing special, though, as an individual. And now gets this job. And some thought that they only gave it to him because he's a former Michigan Fab Five player and they didn't deserve it. He earned it. He got it. He now has it, whether or not it was because of that or not. He's done a, a fantastic job to keep that tradition alive. And it's easier said than done. And there's a lot of pressure on him because if he, would have, if he would get this job and would have started sucking after what happened to that program before with John Beeline, who basically built himself up into a Hall of Famer based on what he, what he did with Michigan after WVU, they would have had to fire a member of the Fab Five. I mean, after the mm -hmm. sanctions have been lifted, that's, it's just a great job he's done so far. 
Yeah, Howard, I, I think what you're going to see over the next couple of years, uh, he had some NBA, I believe, opportunities this past offseason. And he said, no, I'm committed to my university here. I think the difference that you're going to have with him and Beeline, I think, is that Beeline's success, I believe, was predicated a lot by his system. Uh, sure. He John brought the same Howard, system from WVU. Right? Yeah, Juwan Howard is going to be getting uh, NBA five-star players. They're going to want to play for him. Yes. He's a fab and, and five. He's like, It's cool. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that's going to be the difference is that he is going to bring an elite. Not that John Beli didn't do that, but you're going to have a whole – uh, this is just his uh is this this is his first year right is it first or second year first or second i think last yeah. year was his first yeah by the and time, last year was covid and all that by the time he gets his recruiting classes in here i think uh so this is john beeline's players actually yeah, yeah. he's gonna see tom Izzo as having the best uh team in michigan and i, be, I believe they're gonna be the the best team in the big 10 for a long time uh, you know yeah. they're still gonna have some teams from time to time that are gonna um uh, be able to compete with them, um, name right. the team like Purdue or Wisconsin that have those veteran teams. Ohio State, yeah. Yeah, pl players or teams that stick around or players that stick around for three, four years. Michigan's going to have these kids that are there for one or two years, go to the NBA, but he's going to be bringing in elite talent. And I, I think it's going to be fun. I think it's one of those teams where when Michigan is good, I think that's good for – uh, I think that's good for the sport of basketball. For, for, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Mike up here, Mike Bukovic and Mike Osti, presented by Martin Lawn Services here on Pittsburgh Sports Live. Just to kind of put a bow on college basketball, at least for the purpose of this show, and we're going to keep on touching on it here, obviously, as we get towards the Final Four and then the crowning of the National Champions. And we didn't get last year, so it's just a great tournament we've had so far. Perfect right now, as Mike put it. You get the upsets, maybe even get more upsets than you would have thought, and then you're going to get the teams that are deserving eventually. What is – the biggest surprise, the biggest upset for you to this point? I mean, everyone can point, obviously, to Ohio State losing, but maybe besides that, what, what has been a team that maybe disappointed, a, a team that's been able to win and consistently impress you that maybe you're surprised by? What is that moment to this point in this tournament? Uh, I'd have to go with uh, Loyola Chicago. Okay. Um, I know Porter Moser has done a great job there. Both times he's gotten to the tournament the last couple of years, his teams have made runs. Yeah, a, a, a run to say from, the least. Yeah, yeah this team from uh, Illinois was a was loaded. Uh, I, I'd put them on level with Michigan right. as far as the talent they have, uh, led by Kofi Cokeburn, guy that uh, uh, Jeff Capel was uh, recruiting heavily. From a hell of a recruiting job by him. Yeah, Illinois. New York City, uh, Brand yeah. Underwood, uh, Underwood out there. Uh, they're going to be a good uh, program as well. But for them to go out in the second round with the amount of talent that he has at both the guard right. and uh, forward position, you know, he has handful of, at least three NBA players on that team. For them to go out in the second round. To a mid-major. Yeah. You know, Coke Burns not guaranteed to come back. He's a guy that could just pick up and leave. That's a huge – uh, I was never a fan. I believe they got late. They got hot at the end of the season. I wasn't a huge fan of Ohio State throughout the season. Okay. But I was of Illinois. And for them to lose uh, and only win one game in the tournament with that type of talent, uh, uh, to me, that's the big – you know, I know there's a lot of other ones, but – that was the most talented team, I believe, in the tournament to, to get knocked out so far. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. The only pushback I would give, and I saw this a lot on Twitter, and I, I'm tempted to agree, especially off of what they did recently in the tournament. Loyola Chicago has now become a perennial tournament team. They had that deep one recently. You could argue they were misseeded by being eight. And when you misseed one team, you can kind of screw up a whole region because they might have been more four or five that Illinois had to play in the second round in terms of talent, how good they are, how they've been playing, what they've done now for two or three years. Maybe they, there are some saying that it wasn't really, it was by far the toughest yeah, eight yeah, seed yeah. that could be there. So, but when you're Illinois and you have all those yeah. recruits and you still got to get it done. Sure. Yeah, I, I might go, I might go with that if you're talking about a two or three or four seed, but when you're the number one seed uh, in the tournament and playing as well as uh, Illinois was playing heading into this tournament, you know, there's no, no, no excuse. Chicago. There might be one player that can get in that rotation of Illinois. That that team was too talented uh, to lose in the second round. 
I agree. And by the way, we don't have to talk about it here because I already talked about it ad nauseum everywhere mm-hmm. that has had me. For my thoughts on West Virginia's loss to Syracuse, head over to the postgame show still archived in Pittsburgh Sports Live and WV Sports Now. And also, I will drop my full takes on an upcoming episode of Mike Drop. So we will segue to the Steelers offseason. It has been filled with madness as well. And to yeah. our surprise, to my surprise, but we kind of we kind of did set it up that this was the only possibility Juju would return is on a one-year deal, kind of prove himself, didn't have the market, and he it could be a possibility that he would return on that situation. It is what happened. He ended up coming back for one year. He claims and has been reported the Chiefs and Ravens offered him more money and a better deal overall. Granted, he might not have been a number one receiver with those two systems. Regardless, he does return to Pittsburgh. But on the same day, within an hour of that news, the Steelers drop the bomb that they are now shopping Steven Nelson, a player not much older who plays a need position who's also been very, very good. And by dropping Steven Nelson, will make room for Juju. Some confusing moves in the past week or so for the Steelers. Certainly for me, while Juju's a good player and I wouldn't mind him if he's free, uh, even though the antics are annoying for me, certainly he's not a number one. Certainly he's not worth the money he thought he was. He got humbled this offseason for sure when you have other players even going on one-year deals for $10 million. He even took less than that. He, may lo- he might love Pittsburgh, but I also feel he's gone after next year. Certainly anyone who's willing to pay him more, he'll eventually take it. And it's a, re- it's a position of depth. He's not a number one. He, didn't, he hasn't proven that. He didn't play like a number one last year. It's a position of depth. The secondary is not a position of depth, especially losing Hilton, et cetera. Uh, Joe Hayden's career is still in flux, and he's always hurt. So I w- would not think that the dropping Nelson for the betterment of Juju is a wise decision. It appears that kind of was a unilateral decision in some way that they kind of connected. Granted, Nelson is still on this team, we should add. They said they're willing to shop him, but he has not been traded as we're talking. What are your thoughts? How do those two connect the dots for you? And how surprised are you on some decisions the Steelers have made to this point? Well, uh, as far as Juju not getting his money, I think one telling signing signing that took place that maybe put into question what some teams think of him was the Giants signing uh, Kenny Galladay to right. a four-year, $72 million contract. Right. I, I think there was a lot of thought out there that, oh, look at that, all these receivers are sign- just signing one-year deals. There's no market for a receiver. There it is. Yeah, and then, and then the Giants go out and sign him to uh, $72 million. Um, I, I, I'm surprised. I don't understand where um, – I don't understand Kevin Colbert and Mike Tomlin's thinking on this. I really don't. Um, in that – if you had a pick, the Steelers aren't a very deep team. Right. I don't think they're deep at a lot of positions. I think, I think they're good with some talent, but ending behind that, I think they're weak aside from receiver. Yeah, they're depth there. That's the depth. Yeah. That's why That's I never true. thought signing Juju yeah. made sense, even if they had the cap space, because they're deep there. Why risk and pay a mega deal to a deep position? A player that proven he's not number one to this point. I don't care how old he is and what he can do in the future. They're deep there, and they can draft it. They just drafted Chase Claypool to have a basically a Pro Bowl year in his historic season. Yeah, and, and for nothing now. aside from the fact that they're deep, too, is when you're willing to pick up or to pay him uh, – eight million dollars when you're a team that's in salary cap problems that it it, it was just strange all the way around i i have to think that they're they have some other move that they're um planning with this there's no way they made this uh without thinking okay this in the next month or so this is going to happen because they just don't have the depth. They don't have quality depth. If they think they're putting Justin Lane out there, cornerback, uh, to to be a backup to Joe Hayden in case he gets hurt, then they're really in trouble. I don't know what the other move could be though, because the only other player that could get restructured maybe a, that maybe there's a free agent out there. Maybe there's yeah. a free agent out there, a cornerback yeah. that you know they're trying to restructure some contracts or something that we're going to find out in the next couple of days once. Uh, you know, if they're able to work out a deal with Nelson that, you know, once Nelson's gone, uh, then we're going to make this move. I, it, it was a head scratcher. I, I don't Risky. understand it, yeah. especially with the age of uh, Joe Hayden. That, that's the thing. It's not as though you're dealing with a guy that 
you know, Minka Fitzpatrick's age to where, right. okay, we're going to have it for a while. Joe Hayden could hit the end of his career like that. You oh, know, sure. Have 30 some year old cornerbacks, starting cornerbacks to play at high levels for a long time. It's a very difficult position with the athleticism. The He's team. hurt all the time. Yeah, that's what I mean. And they have nothing behind him. Uh, that That's the, I, I don't know. One thing that tells me though, is that uh, cornerback is going to be something that's going to be uh, very high on their draft board next uh, come next month. And it was interesting. Mike Tomlin, mm -hmm. and Kevin Colbert uh, yesterday were at Florida state uh, and, they, and they have a pretty good cornerback down there, Asante Samuels jr. So we'll see if that uh, um, we'll see if that possibly could develop in April, but I, I just didn't understand Juju. It makes no sense, but it also tells me another thing too, Mike, is that we were thinking, okay, maybe the Steelers are going to be converting to a little bit of a running team or whatever. No, Ben Roethlisberger is still controls this team despite whatever anyone thinks of him. Right. He's going to have uh, four wide receivers. He's going to be throwing 40 sometimes a game. I think this just cemented that with the fact that uh, he has he has four quality receivers and a quality tight end to throw to. I mean, it's a passing league, so I don't think you can go back to old Steeler way football and be able to win a championship in today's NFL. But we've also learned, and this has even been true for Ben his entire career, but certainly the last couple of years, that there's a difference between throwing 35, 40, 45 times with Ben then jumping it up to 60 plus. And that happened in multiple games last year. He joked about it, that if I can throw 70 times, I'll do it. I'll love it. Well, he did it a couple of times, including the playoff game, which led to a career amount of yards for a postseason game for the Steelers, but also four interceptions, which killed him and sunk him before they even got going. So you don't ideally want to be throwing that many passes. They do have tons of talent. You want to have the, the wide receiver depth. It's good to have the depth. Again, if Juju could be free and there's no salary cap, it's okay to bring him in for depth, even if you believe he's not number one. But there is a salary cap, and the needs just aren't there at receiver. That was always my thing. Everyone can have their opinions about the antics, and I certainly sometimes feel he's annoying as well. Uh, but my issue really was just on the field. It's not a need position. He's declined the last couple years. He certainly is not number one based on what he's done production-wise. 831 yards, 97 catches, yards per catch, just not there for number one. Couldn't get their separation. Hasn't had the numbers since AB. He's good. He's not great. And it's a neat, It's not a neat position, unlike the secondary that it is. So now I'd imagine the secondary, maybe even linebacker again, could be position the Steelers going to be looking at in the draft in addition to running back because we've yet to hear the Connor news but that seemingly was a player the Steelers just and everyone assumed was gone and they basically have told everyone without actually literally saying it that he's not a featured back for them so he's likely getting his money elsewhere kind of surprising he's still dangling but yeah the, the market just wasn't there for Juju in terms of a mega deal his mentality might be I'll come back I'll be a number one with the Steelers in his mind and I'll have my value get increased next year. Whereas if I went to the Ravens or Chiefs, I might be a two or a three because if Hollywood Brown would emerge or Kelsey or whoever else with those teams and, and they're already sound offensively, maybe that's his thinking. I will tell you, even for Juju though, Mike, it is a major risk for Juju. I don't believe he had the mega, mega offers that he claims he had out there where everyone was, was calling his phone. I think he was humbled this offseason. He's trying to save face now. But I'll put it to you this way. If what Juju and his Juju fans are saying is true and he got all these great offers and he just wanted to come back to Pittsburgh to go for the ring one more time that they're not going to win and he loves Pittsburgh so much and that's it and he just took the littlest contract around because he loves Pittsburgh so much, I said it before and I'll say it again, he's dumb then. It was a wrong move if that was reality because next year, Ben being a year older, the team being similar, probably worse overall, I don't see his numbers being better, probably very similar to what he did this year. And if he gets hurt or has similar numbers, his value is even lesser, even though there'll be more money to play with with the TV deals and all that. It's a major risk for him if that's true. I think he was really humbled. But just in all reality for Pittsburgh, that's just not a need position. So even if he wants to come back for one year at less than you claim market value, it's still $8 million. They didn't have the room. And if they have to move Nelson to bring in Juju – then no, I flat out don't agree with it because Nelson's still in his 20s. He's much younger than Joe Hayden. Some could say he was down from what they thought they were getting with him a couple years ago, but he still was really, really good in the best they have. So I think he's worth it to them being the Steelers and other teams. You, you saw the tweets from, from 
Steven Nelson the second that was reported saying blessing in disguise I'm gonna bet on myself he knows how good he is he knows the market out there he's not worried he's gonna get his money he's gonna be on another team he'll land and he'll be fine Juju was the concern for himself and it's been confusing but I guess we can't fully evaluate it until we see who they draft how they work the practice squad how they work the money if there's something else dangling out there that I'm I I just have to think I just have to think that there's a uh, something else out there I don't see how they're better otherwise. Yeah, I don't think they'll be better. But in in all honesty, I mentioned this last week. I I know they'll never say this. It would be better. (laughs) It would be good for the Steelers if this deal, if this was a bad deal as far as losing, if they end up do trading Steven Nelson or releasing him, and they're bad. They, they, They need to be bad this year. They're not. Maybe even really, really bad. Yeah, they need to be really bad <laughs> right. for a year or two in order to build this thing back up. And uh, there's too many quality teams in the AFC. The Steelers' schedule this year. It's too hard paper. to trade up in the draft like they did. It looks, mur- it looks like murder. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to compete. Uh, but Yeah, I, they're I playing a division championship schedule. They're playing right, a harder right, schedule right. next year than they played this past season. And, they, and they're screw- they're, their schedule this year is just brutal. So, uh right. It, it might be a blessing in disguise. Who knows what they're thinking over there? But um, as far as Juju, I think it was a. Uh, I actually think it was a good deal for him to come back here if that was his options. Just because he's not going to put up the numbers in Kansas City. You get you get paid in this league by numbers. Right. He's not going to get especially as a receiver in Kansas City's offense and in Baltimore's off because of too many throwing weapons. And with the Ravens, they run the ball too much. Uh, Lamar Jackson isn't an accurate passer. They don't throw the ball enough for him to put up monster numbers, which would decline his value again. So yeah, and Philadelphia has a quarterback concern because that was the other team that he he brought up in a TikTok that the Philadelphia Eagles called him last minute. There, there's concern if Hurts can really get it done. They just moved on from right, Wentz. Exactly. There's no safety net the best, there. This is the best opportunity for him right. to put up to put up numbers. So we'll see. Uh, Okay. We'll see what happens. But uh, it's almost baseball, Mike. I almost. know uh, people, nobody's talking about it. And, you know, the Pirates are the Pirates. Right. But I still like baseball. Uh, I do, I'm too. enjoy the season no matter what. Uh, they're actually not doing bad. Uh, Jason Mackey, who I'm a huge fan of as far as his coverage on uh, with the Pittsburgh uh, Post-Gazette, you know, he had some numbers talking about their offense and how uh, their offense is light years ahead as far as run totals compared to last season. Pitching yeah. looks better. Okay. Do you put any stock in anything team-wise or anything individual-wise that uh, you've seen out of uh, from Bradenton this year? <sighs> no. <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean that to be negative because I think everybody would agree, even the most optimistic pirate fan, that this is not going to be a playoff season. This is, it doesn't matter how many spots they expand. This is going to be a team that is going to be going through growing pains this year. And that's okay because they now are getting closer to admitting the rebuild. They've made some moves that made sense at the time. They actually won some of those deals. I don't think they get credit for winning, unlike few deals of the past. I think Charrington's done a solid job to this point. And there's reason to, for hope in terms of even if you're a casual fan, just to watch the games based on Key Brian Hayes at the end of last year and how he could play this year. There are some national projections claiming he's going to be potentially an all-star and one of the better outfielders in the league and certainly defensively. And he can kind of be that next McCutcheon to be a face of your franchise. We do need to wait and see, though. That's why it's no for me yet. It's wait and see. We've only seen that from him for a month and a half. You know this about baseball players, especially after a long layoff. You can be great for a month and a half, and then you can stink up the joint for the next three months when you return the next season. Pitchers now have seen him a little bit more. There's more tape on him. We will see. I do believe in him a little bit, but then, of course, who knows how long he'll be in Pittsburgh and that that whole trajectory. I don't think he's enough, though, on his own. I, I think the lineup could maybe be better than people think if Brian Reynolds could pick it up again, and we've seen a little bit flashes of that. Mm-hmm. I don't think he'll be close to what he was two years ago because that might have been too much to expect with, with double-type numbers every other day and, and setting records as a double machine. But if he's way better than last year, that'll be an improvement since last year was so bad. I, for me, though, am concerned more about the pitching. I know it's been okay in the spring, but the pitching was real bad at times last year, even 
when it was good, then the offense wouldn't give them enough. We saw that with some Musgrove starts. I just don't have enough confidence in the pitching staff. I don't have enough confidence in the bullpen. I could see games where they lose three to two or two to one and games like that. Um, I could see that there not being enough offense there. I could see there not being enough pitching overall. I could see issues all the way around. I still feel like there's a 90 plus loss team. Maybe they won't lose 100 and some and be one of the worst teams ever. I do think there are some teams that are worse than them, Baltimore in particular. But they've shown some promise this spring, but we've also seen teams like the Cincinnati Reds have been great the last couple of springs and then do nothing in the regular season. So it's not always indicative. We will see. And key Brian Hayes is literally the key to look at in terms of what you're building for because he is one player even more so than Reynolds that is going to be there for a while. Reynolds too, though, but key Brian Hayes is that maybe that next face. So there's reason to like the spring, but I'm not going to buy too much stock and slurp the Kool-Aid based on the spring. Last year wasn't enough of a sample size for me with even the players that played well. And while the division has got easier, that is a plus for the Pirates. The Cubs kind of shipping some yeah. players off. The division is easier now. It still feels like they're several years away. They are building to something. Charrington has made some solid moves. You can't judge him on past regimes. He's won before, of course, but not with a small market. But I'm not ready to get excited. But I do want, want, I do want to see Key Brian Hayes, after having some of these pitchers have seen him in the regular season at the end of last year, see him early in this, this next season. If he has a slow start, I would be concerned if he can mentally get out of it. But I want to see him the first few months and see what happens. But I can't slurp the Kool-Aid off of, uh, off of yeah. March with the Pirates with how down yeah, I, I, they appeared. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you uh, with some of what you said. But a couple things that I like, I, I know it's even if they're not going to be here, guys like uh, Kevin Newman, uh, I believe he's hitting now, and I realize it's spring training. and Right. Uh, that's means zero coming into April, but uh, you know, he's looks like the player he was a couple of years ago, as far as his offense. I think after today, he's hitting over 700. In he spring. was an underrated piece two years ago. Everyone yeah, talked about Reynolds. Adam he Frazier. was an underrated piece two years ago. I think Adam Frazier is a guy that there's no doubt is going to eventually be traded just because they have yeah. uh, Gonzalez, their first round pick uh, last season. He's swinging the bat. Well, you know, you have an infield of uh, Frazier, Newman, Hayes, if uh, Reynolds could play. Very young team, yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's okay. But uh, the funny thing is with the the Pirates, that it's going to be the topic of um, for the next couple months, and it's already happening. And this just is totally uh, – it's going to be the biggest move of Ben Sherrington's uh, career with the Pirates and figure as it has to happen. The number one pick – was supposed to be come it was Kumar Rocker from right. Vanderbilt. It was no doubt he's the number one pick. However, now his teammate Jack Leiter, son of uh, former uh, New York Mets pitcher, Florida pitcher Al Leiter. Al Leiter, yeah. He is fastly moving up the draft draft board, and he has the lineage. People love the yes. legacy players. In baseball. And over the weekend, he had a 16 strikeout, no hit performance for Vanderbilt. Those two are going to be the number one and two picks in the draft this year. Mm -hmm. And now there's some debate, do the Pirates pick Rocker? Do they pick Leiter? If things are going to be like they were for the Pirates for the last 25 years, Sherrington's going to pick the wrong guy, meaning that uh, he'll pick Rocker. Lighter will end up being the best player, the better player. Yeah, vice, or vice versa. Yeah, right. exactly. But if the things are do change for the Pirates and they're going to head in the right direction, then Sherrington will pick the right guy. We'll see what happens. But this, so that'll no doubt be a storyline over the next uh, couple months. I've been following Vanderbilt baseball just to see these guys. Is, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw somebody say actually that, that Pittsburgh Outlaws just needed to send a reporter to Vanderbilt rather than yeah. forget Bradenton, Florida, because that's where the story is. Oh, and that no really, question. really is true. Again, this next year, even if it's better than some would, would, would expect, mean, it's, it's not going to be a World Series year. They're not going to win the pennant for the next few years, of course. So it is about building it up. It is about that. And especially – you look at Garrett Cole, he's building himself up into a Hall of Famer now, but he didn't really become an ace type of pitcher until leaving Pittsburgh, maybe a little bit with the Pirates, but not fully. They haven't really had an ace gem in probably 25 years, maybe Oliver Perez briefly for a year or so, but not somebody that consistently could stay in Pittsburgh and be an ace for five to 10 years. That has not been there. So if they can find that guy 
and can sign him and have that work, that would be tremendous, although also a position player who can be that next face is big, and maybe that'll be just be key Brian Hayes in general. But that'll be a major decision, and that's a decision that as much as Ben Charrington's won a World Series with the Red Sox with a bigger market, he never had to make a decision that tough because here's the difference of big market versus small, and I'm not taking the credit away from his ring, but if you mess up that decision with the Red Sox, you then could say, okay, I messed up. Now we're going to go in free agent pool and spend $200 million to make up for it with the biggest free agent available out there because we can spend that money. Oh, my bad. We'll just spend the money and make up for it. He messes up that decision with the Pirates. He screws himself and the franchise for the next decade. Exactly. And that's why it's going to be, it's going to be a fascinating, it really is. It's going to be a fat, it's going to be something that's going to be, I I know a lot of the media hates covering the Pirates now just because they, you know, because they stink. I can't deny that some of the post-game shows last year were rough. If I was, uh, you know, if I was still in my TV days, we would be, I'd be be hounding my news director to get a crew down to Nashville or uh, to, you know, to be covering Vanderbilt and to find out, you know, do something with those guys. That's going to be an unbelievable storyline heading into the draft. Is it Jack Leiter? Is it Kumar Rocker? Yeah, and I'd love to get Outlighter's takes on that, as he's every right. now and then on MLB Network. And, of course, those legacy players, the Barry Bonds, Ken Griffey Jr., those legacy players, they just love them. Tony Gwynn having his son play. Legacy players are big in Major League Baseball, and this could be another one. We will see. He certainly has the tutelage, because sometimes you feel like when you have a legacy player, if he's going wrong for a month, he'll call up Pops, who's pitched in World Series games, who pitched for 20-plus years. He's not a Hall of Famer, but Outlighter had a great career kind of underrated not the case when you don't have that lineage fair or unfair that might be a tiebreaker scenario but that's a big decision to say the very least that'll do it for this tuesday edition of the show hump day coming up the the madness continues more madness i'm sure will befall us whether it be the nfl offseason coming up to the pirate season as we are now less than 10 days we were in single digits to opening day as amazing as that sounds we're gonna get there too on time it looks like despite a pandemic it's a whole different year this year we're getting our sports in and the college basketball tournament not yet over mark man is still in full effect some cinderella's still out there playing whether we get to the chalk at the end of the day or not (laughs) so that's going to be it for this one here again mic'd up presented by martin lawn services that's mike bacope again i'm mike osby for all of us at pittsburgh sports live and pittsburgh sports now have a good morning go about your day and check in with all the sites for all your coverage throughout